Hello and welcome to Business Today Television. I'm Siddharth Zarabi and with me Prashant Ruya, Director of SR Capital from our studios at the India Today Business Today studio in Davos. Welcome. The sun is out, uh, Prashant, and uh, you know, we're having a better day than yesterday in this regard. But uh, you've been here. Yes. And uh, the, the fact that you've been spending time here meeting a lot of people. The first question for today. How's the India story panning out this time round in Davos? First of all, thank you, uh, Siddharth. And this is certainly a lot better than the last time <laughs> when it was really cold and it was early in the morning. So, but it's a beautiful day right now. And uh, for for me, uh, you know, Davos has been something which I've been coming to for more than 15 years. So, you know, I've seen uh, it evolve. And um, I, I can say, I think with confidence that... Uh, the positioning which India has today and for this Davos uh, has actually never been better. Uh, the general impression is that for, for sure amongst most people you meet is that the uh, all the, uh, the levers which are working are working now, economic levers that is, are working in favor of India. Uh, it is easily one of the most uh, 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 favored investment destinations right now uh, globally. And if you just look around what's happening in the world, whether it's in Europe or I think U.S. still still is very good. Uh, but if you look around what's happening with China and, and Europe and other parts of Asia, then uh, India just just stands out. And I just feel that this is the first Davos uh, in Amritkal. And, uh, and, you know, it's 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 really beckoning for for, uh, uh, you know, for for the for the for the group here in, and the community here. Uh, Prashant, what explains the resilience uh, uh, of Indian CEOs? And the reason I asked you this earlier today, uh, we uh, provided an exclusive view of a very detailed CEO survey. It's a global survey by PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, over 4,400 odd Indian respondents, right. 86% of them are optimistic about the prospects of the economy. Right. Only 44% of global CEOs are. What explains this difference and why this resilience? I think uh, India has been through, uh, you know, a few years of slow growth, uh, consolidation, if you will. Uh, and uh, I think most corporate balance sheets uh, are heavily delevered. Um, and uh, the opportunity to grow, I mean, to be honest, uh, we have not seen significant capital investment in the country in the last five, seven years, five, ten years, I would say. I think after 2000. 16, 17, uh, most of the investments have been being made by government and public sector and all of that. Uh, and then, uh, and most of the latent capacity, surplus capacity, which we had in manufacturing, most of that has got effectively taken away in terms of consumption. And uh, every sector now is looking, uh, you know, looking at a massive uh, demand supply gap in terms of what India needs to manufacture or what we need to produce to meet the demand. I mean, we are growing, you know, 7%, more than 7% a year GDP. Uh, I mean, all the numbers are, are known and, uh, and, you know, India really needs to invest massively to, to keep up with the, with the growing consumer demand. The second big, the, the, the second big uh, obviously, there's a huge change taking place around energy transition. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge area because uh, for the first time, India can actually really play a role in becoming an exporter of energy. Now, for 50 years now, maybe more, India has always been a huge importer of energy. And this is really the first time with the new technology, with solar, with wind, with green hydrogen, with green ammonia, with all these new technologies uh, which are coming in, we actually have a chance to compete globally. And so, you know, it's a combination of many factors. Obviously, service sector remains very, very robust, very, very strong. Uh, and the other big thing which is changing is that India is becoming a favored destination for manufacturing, global supply chain. Um, given with what's happening with China, uh, everybody, every major corporation wants to have an alternate base of manufacture, whether it's automotive, whether it's Apple, whether it's, you know, you, you name it. And India is uh, therefore, has, that's another huge opportunity, not only for international companies, but for Indian uh, companies to, you know, to be that supply chain or to be part of that supply chain. So it's a it's a combination of really many, many factors coming together. Prashant, one of the things that, uh, and you referred to this about the government doing the heavy lifting and uh, someone recently aggregated statistics and data and said that uh, 
four or five of the largest groups in India are investing massive amounts uh, across sectors, including the uh, green energy space. Right. Uh, does that uh, really mean that this belief that the private sector is not uh, investing after the down cycle, the banking down cycle that we saw, uh, is that a wrong belief or is this only in this one space where we are seeing massive, massive significance, including from you? Yeah. Look, uh, I mean, I I think it would be unfair to say that private sector did not get, investment did not get dampened uh, with what happened with the banking system. Uh, and uh, it did slow many other, many, many, many private sector companies or groups down. But I think that phase is largely passed. And uh, most people have, you know, addressed it. Most people have either delivered or they found solutions. And uh, I think that, you know, going forward now, everybody is looking at how we can create new capacity, how can we build new technologies. Uh, there's a huge startup ecosystem which is now flourishing in, in India. So, I mean, uh, I, yes, I would say in the initial years, I mean, f let's say four, five years ago, three, four years ago, uh, it had an impact and the government was doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but I think that's passed now. You know, uh, business moves in a cycle, economies move in cycles, and you've seen various cycles. What is different in this cycle? Because everywhere, including at Davos, uh, uh, there are uh, foreign investors, right. foreign companies who simply want to listen and buy into the India story. Seems like a fresh gold rush, uh, Prashant. <laughs> No, look, uh, I just think that if you look around India and all the uh, economic uh, parameters around India, we seem to be in a far more firmer footing. Uh, the, you know, if you look at, frankly, if you look at how India handled uh, COVID, I mean, this part of the world, Europe, uh, US was really badly affected. But India came out of COVID without significant growth in inflation, without, you know, currency depreciation, without all the things which people really were Worried and, and about. Look at what has happened in our immediate neighborhood also. In exactly. You know, terms. Absolutely. So, India really handled that well. And that also was something which, frankly, other people were quite surprised with. How did, you know, how did this happen? Uh, obviously, we handled the energy, uh, the rise in energy crisis, the energy um, uh, cost going up globally. We handled that very well. Of course, we took an independent view of the world, but that in the end, that seems to be the right view and we've worked and out. there's no question of disagreeing with that. Yeah. Uh, and the government has explained that so many times. That Absolutely. So, that, so you know, if you just think about the steps and the actions which India has taken, uh, it has it has stood out compared to what other people have done. And, uh, and I think it's an opportunity for both Indian groups, Indian families, Indian entrepreneurs, uh, Indian companies to invest. But it's also an opportunity for international companies to come into India and, and participate in the in the growth which we are expecting. Absolutely. Last year when we spoke here, one of the key themes that we had spoken about is the fact that you had completed your uh, deleveraging cycle and a year has passed since then. Uh, for uh, our viewers, w what's the progress been since then? Uh, because you clearly have done a massive cleanup and now uh, obviously people uh, will look forward to hearing your views on how the green shoots are growing. <laughs> well, uh it's been an eventful few years, uh, I would say three, four years. But I think about maybe a couple of years back, we we uh, we completed most of the deleveraging cycle. So I think that's sort of cert certainly behind us. Uh, we've pivoted the group uh, heavily uh, within the sectors which we which we are. We've pivoted uh, into tech into future technologies, which are you know a little bit future centric, if you will, uh, green ecosystems which are getting developed. Uh, and so and and around uh, you know value value accretion value creation theme uh, i i would say with those sort of broad themes we have pivoted the group uh, we are looking at you know many many uh, opportunities which are and developed them in the last few years which we are very excited about uh, I, as i said it's a you know if you look at the energy space or if you look at the metals and mining space infrastructure space i mean just take infrastructure for for example i mean india is today the government of India is actually investing, you know, more than 40 billion a year uh, just from the budget alone in building new infrastructure. And that's just the equity piece. So if you add on the leverage, uh, it's more than 120 billion dollars of of uh, infrastructure investment taking place uh, in the in the country in all parts. And we are seeing it visibly. I'm from Mumbai. And in Mumbai, we, it, it's a complete, you know, sort of sea change. Uh, have you had the opportunity? I haven't because it just opened a uh, couple of days back and uh, three days ago. And I was, I've not had the opportunity, but I certainly will 
as soon as I get so back. So you plan to take a joyride one, soon? One hundred percent. It's a, it's an amazing amazing feat. I, I saw it when it was under construction and uh, really amazing. And then if you look at what's happening with coastal coastal road and metro and all of this, so it's a real renaissance taking place in terms of the infrastructure de- uh, development. And so it's a great opportunity. So we we are looking at how can we you know participate in this in this revolution. One on infrastructure, one around the green ecosystem. What what we think is that you know. Every piece of every piece of manufacturing capacity, whatever we've had, is either will transition or will need to be replaced. One of the two over time. Now nobody believes that it's all happening in the next five, seven, ten years, but in the next twenty years, I think is a sort of reasonable, reasonable time frame to to think that you know a lot of this is happening and technologies are coming and which are making it extremely competitive. Also, I mean, we're seeing it in solar power. I mean, it is cheaper today to make solar power than you know, and coal-based power. I mean, yes, it's albeit it's not 24 hours, but you know, sun yeah. is, the sun is right there. The sun does shine. <laughs> uh, one of the things on infrastructure before I move to another topic: how critical uh, has uh, the change in policy, the approach towards infrastructure been? Because 10 years ago, litigation was the norm in infrastructure, right. and dozens of groups have burned their hands very, very badly with infrastructure. This What's time it? around, it seems to be very, very different. Is government policy uh, a very critical uh, enabler? Massive, massive enabler. Uh, so many of the many of the things which people really got stuck up with, uh, mm-hmm. uh, new policies which have come out uh, ha- with the, by the government has actually changed. Whether it is land acquisition, uh, which was a big issue, whether it was licenses, uh, which are which were earlier given and now it has to be bid, uh, whether it was uh, you know just the way we approached infrastructure of basically starting things before we had all the approvals uh, you know and then getting stuck halfway uh, you know it, it it's a complete different mindset and now if you think you know the speed at which infrastructure is getting built in India I mean it's it's not it's comparable to anywhere else in the world probably faster uh, I mean we are I mean you just take the trans harbor link I mean it's four years yes couple of years because of uh, because of covid but if you think about the speed at which you know, this infrastructure uh, absolutely, would have absolutely. got done. I mean, normally in Mumbai, we would have said, you know, uh-huh. but it's ready. Absolutely. And we've seen those And stories. the coastal road, it's just amazing what uh, they're doing. And, and, and we've seen those stories all across India. And it's across India. I mean, national highways, you know, metros all over. The Delhi, Delhi is a great example. So uh, absolutely. I, think it's a, I it's also a, live close to a showpiece uh, uh, infrastructure, an expressway, the Yasho Bhumi, and yes, I've seen how uh, it's uh, it would have been, in fact, done faster had COVID not interrupted. Exactly. Let's come to one of your recent announcements in the state of Gujarat. It's a favored investment destination right. for all groups. Uh, Fifty odd thousand crore of plans. Um, where does all of that go? These MOUs, and how do you plan to uh, fund those uh, initiatives? So well. Um, so that, you know, uh, Gujarat has always been favored destination for the SR group. We've been most of our investments over the last over the last two decades has been in in Gujarat. So, no surprise there. But uh, but we uh, you know we are what we are basically trying to do is build a, a, a green uh, molecule, green ammonia, green hydrogen uh, facility, which can then get converted into different green molecules. But we are looking at it more as an export as opposed to a domestic uh, in a domestic consumption. Uh, and again, as, as as we as you know, as you probably know, we we have a, a, a facility in the UK, which where we are supplying close to 16% of UK's fuel uh, from our refinery there, and we are converting that into a energy transition hub, where we are building hydrogen and uh, decarbonizing the refinery, and and then we can if we can add to that supply of green molecules as a as a biofuel or as in different forms green ammonia etc then that becomes a very interesting uh, you know play so we are looking at it from that perspective it's a, it's an interesting uh, very interesting opportunity as you know many many groups have made significant investment uh, of, uh, in announcements around it and and the opportunity is there for everybody to uh, you know to prosper one of the other things that uh, that's drawn attention is your plan to invest uh, 4 billion dollars in Saudi Arabia, it, this is going to be a low carbon steel plant. The question that is being asked is, does that imply that you would look at steel in India as well? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, uh, steel is obviously close to our heart and uh, and uh, we believe that the future, uh, at least the, what we are seeing, is around green steel. 
and moving and pivoting away from you know fossil uh, from CO2. Um, steel, as you know, is one of the most uh, polluting industries from a CO2 perspective. Mm -hmm. And obviously, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the next decade, in the next 15 years, 20 years, there will be a need to transition. And so we are trying to see whether we can play a role in that uh, in that space. And uh, green steel is the future, which basically means uh, utilizing you know uh, uh, yeah, solar power and hydrogen as energy source for steel making. It's a basic as compared to coal. Mm. So that's the basic difference. Uh, sorry, coal and natural gas, so mm. which are the traditional sources of fuel yes. in steel making, mm. right? So that's the uh, that's the play. We are obviously trying to develop this project uh, in Saudi Arabia. It's not yet fully. We're not fully yet ready there. Uh, we still have some approvals pending, but but uh, we, so we are still trying to develop it. But we're looking at you know we're looking at opportunities to see how we can uh, play a role in this space. As we wind down this conversation, I uh, remember what you had said last year, right here, and you sort of spoken about the fact that SR, uh, which uh, uh, did a lot of work in India, was now also looking at uh, globally. So today, a year later, if I were to say, uh, what's going to be the mix of the SR footprint? Uh, how much in India? How much overseas? How would you respond? So it's a uh, interesting question. I I think we've always been, you know, over the last, I think, from 2010-12. We've become uh, global uh, in our outlook. So within the sectors, but global view. So uh, today, I would say between 35 and 40 percent of what we do as SR is in India, and will remain so. Uh, and we still we believe heavily in the uh, in the uh, India story. Uh, but and then the rest is overseas because we've also made investments in the UK. We've made investments in the US, which uh, which obviously we want to develop along uh, along also. Uh, and 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 so that's pretty much going to be the mix uh, mix for now. But uh, you know, let's see if India moves, then uh, maybe that'll change. And we will continue to track and monitor that change uh, of the SR group. Prashant Ruya, thank you very much for your time with us today. With that, it's a wrap on this conversation. We'll see you again. Until then, bye bye. Lovely, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye.